Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Nate. I also go by Hockey Boy and Nate. And today we are finally here. We are here at day one of our first severe weather route break. And so we're going to be talking about that as well as we are going to be talking about the uh, the other severe weather outbreak that's going to be happening in the mid part of next week. So real quickly, uh, I'm going to go through these uh, the following three slides. If you are in these areas, I have timestamps all the way throughout the video, so you can watch your spe uh, those specific timestamps instead of watching all the way through. So uh, if you're in this uh, these areas, you're going to want to watch Friday's timestamp. If you are in this area, you're going to want to watch Saturday's timestamp. And then if you're in this area, you're going to want to watch Tuesday's and Wednesday's timestamp for next week. Uh, but if you guys want to do me a favor, please be sure to leave a like on the video. Subscribe if you're new. Turn on notifications. Share this with friends and family and on social media. So also, as well as follow me on social media. As, as well as uh, be aware that I am going to live stream tonight here uh, on the severe weather event that will be occurring here today. So uh, if you guys are excited for that, um, then stay tuned and be ready for whenever I do. Uh, I actually don't know when I'm going to because of the messy storm mode and how it, everything uh, transpires within this event today is making it very difficult for me to forecast when uh, the event will actually start go uh, get going and start to get serious. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get something out there. And uh, it, we're kind of half and half with our chaser. Um, he's like half and half of whether or not he's going to chase or not, but if he does chase, he's going to be chasing near Wichita Falls, so something interesting with that. All right, here's the day one outlook. It just got issued at 9 Eastern Daylight Time, 8 Central, um, so I just put it in before uh, I started recording. Um, and so you have two different enhanced risks, uh, one which is for Central and Southern parts of Oklahoma. You have another that is for Eastern um eastern texas into southern parts of arkansas and uh, northern parts of louisiana into central parts of louisiana so if you guys live in places like oklahoma city baton rouge shreveport lafayette norman uh lufkin um tyler texas you guys really need to watch uh this event as it transpires here uh tonight into uh tomorrow uh, we're going to take a look at the hail risk here. First off, 5% uh, is indicated in this brown. A 15% is indicated in this yellow. And a significant risk is indicated in this uh, this black polygon with the uh, dotted lines in it. So 5% uh, and 15% on normal conditions. It would be uh, that probability of you seeing large hail one inch or larger within 25 miles of a point and then within that hatch risk you guys have a 10 percent chance or greater on top of the original chance of you guys seeing two inch size hail or larger within 25 miles of a point so if you're in the hatch risk i would highly recommend bringing in valuables that are outside uh, and putting them in uh, under cover or indoors so such as cars or pets but cars and uh, garages or uh, some sort of cover for if you will, and then pets and doors and stuff like that. Uh, just just be aware that you guys could potentially see some very large hail moving through your areas. So Dallas, Fort Worth area, Austin, uh, you know, Oklahoma City, uh, all the way down to Wichita Falls, you guys could potentially see some of that large significant hail in your area. Um, then we also have our wind risk here. This is what's driving our enhanced risk here today. Uh, two different uh, wind risks here, but uh, all the within the same parameters. So 5 is brown, 15 is uh, indicated in the yellow, and in the red is our 30% chance for uh, damaging winds. So uh, whatever probability you have, um, that is your probability of seeing over 58 mile per hour wind gusts, uh, which can down trees and power lines and do damage to sightings uh with uh in houses or outside of houses so if you guys live over there you guys really need to monitor that and then we also have our tornado risk we have two five percents here uh which is indicated in brown your two percent which is indicated in this green uh, so you have this five percent right here for the triple point i'm actually really confident that a uh, 
a supercell will most likely develop right here within this 5%. So uh, whether or not we get a tornado over there is uh, yet to be determined, but we'll have to continue to uh, monitor that closely uh, once we start live streaming and once the event progresses. Then you also have your 5% that is over here in eastern Texas, central to northern parts of Louisiana, into parts of Mississippi and uh, Arkansas. And uh, this will be more or less uh, on a widespread scale from whenever prefrontal convection starts all the way until tomorrow morning because there's going to be uh, so many scattered cells that uh, could be tornadic within there, could be uh, supercellular. And, you know, we're just, as I said, we're going to have to continue to monitor this as we, as this gets closer and, uh, as we live stream. Let's take a look at the, uh, the, uh, simulated radar here. Um, uh, just the thing to note is that the top right here, this is the, uh, time and, uh, to which these storms actually will be moving on through. So if you guys want to pay attention to that, uh, that, would, you know, that might help, <laughs> but a lot of scattered storms here, um, that is forecasted for the early afternoon hours uh, into the uh, mid to late afternoon hours. You can see thunderstorms start to develop on a widespread scale here, uh, all the way up into Kansas, down into uh, Arkansas, uh, down towards Texas. And as this continues to progress, more cells begin to develop, uh, more thunderstorms uh, begin to push on through. Um, all of these, you know, there's a giant 2% risk for tornadoes. So all of this you know, could have a chance of producing something, um, you know, whether it's severe or not, just one of the, one of these days to where you're probably going to want to stay indoors. I'll say that much, but a lot of these storms, uh, that are really starting to fire up and become a uh, discreet. So that is something to really, uh, monitor for the most part. One thing that I do want to uh, mention here is that towards the uh, evening hours, this is when some of these thunderstorms near the triple point can start to form. And so this is uh, those storms over there, as well as these storms down here along the uh, dry line could potentially form, uh, could potentially bring some very large hail uh, and upwards of uh, two, maybe even three, inch, uh, three inches in diameter. Uh, that could most certainly dent cars and even break uh, break and bust windshields. So uh, definitely something to where I'd highly recommend bringing your cars indoors, especially since that wouldn't be a fun time explaining your situation to the insurance agency. So, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> not a fun time for the most part. Uh, but a lot of these cells then begin to push off on through and merge with the uh, scattered convection that's uh, moving off into the uh, eastern parts of Texas. Then you have more cells that begin to develop it near the triple point uh, here at around 9 o'clock. And this could be some very large hail as well. You also have some more cells that are forming down here near Austin or that could potentially form. So anywhere along this dry line that you'll see here in a second could form thunderstorms. And if they do form thunderstorms, very large hail could come off of it. So definitely something to keep in mind with that. Those cells do uh, end up becoming a bit more linear, and that's the reason why there's that 30% chance for wind over in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, that'll be into the later ends, uh, the later stages of the event, past or at around midnight. Uh, you can also see more of your thunderstorms begin to fire off here or uh, become a bit more uh, discreet uh, coming off of the Gulf of Mexico towards um, places like Louisiana and Mississippi. And so that's the reason why there is still that 5% chance for tornadoes over there. Uh, and you'll actually see here in a second that that also turns uh, pretty gusty for the most part um, with this uh, QLCS that starts to form with all of these uh, thunderstorms in the line. And that's the reason why they also have the 30% chance for wind over there as well. Taking a look a bit closer at some of the areas here in the deep south, uh, because we actually have... You know, we actually have an area that we can look at with the uh, with weather bell. So that's pretty interesting for the most part. But 3 a.m., you got a lot of these thunderstorms that are really going to start to fire off. And they're really going to uh, start moving on through from the Gulf of Mexico. So I would not be surprised that if any uh, anywhere within this area could really get some severe storms. Um, some could potentially be uh, severe, maybe even tornadic in some instances. So uh, definitely have emergency notifications on. Uh, just in case if um, 
you know, the National Weather Service issues a uh, tornado warning, a severe thunderstorm warning, flash flood warning, something like that. Uh, that way you guys can plan accordingly. As well as if you have a weather radio on, make sure that you uh, either have it filled up with batteries or it's plugged in. Because uh, this is a, uh, this is, you know, another overnight event. And it is not fun with an overnight event, you know. We, we've been covering overnight events for the most part, and I can tell you it's not very fun uh, for the most part. So, uh, As this continues to move on through into the early morning hours and the sunrise hours, you actually have a lot of storms that uh, form within its own discrete lines, uh, QLCSs, and uh, how that portrays uh, into Saturday is uh, a bit called into question. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the video. Dew points really moist for the most part. I mean, look at this. Some of these areas are in the 70s. You have uh, areas that get into the 60s uh, in these yellows all the way up into Oklahoma here. So a lot of moisture is present with this event uh, as this moves on through. A lot of cape because of that. Uh, convective available potential energy. The more cape in the atmosphere, the uh, stronger the storms typically would be. And so uh, in these reds, you can see an upwards of 3,000 joules per kilogram. That is uh, that is a lot of energy. You typically only need you know around 1,500 uh, 1, to 2,000 joules per kilogram. So a lot of energy here along this dry line. And uh, th the thing about it is, is if we go back to the uh, dew points, you can see this uh, this differential right here between uh, this moist air and this relatively dry air. And so what we call that in between the two is the dry line. And so anytime storms uh, form along the dry line, you could typically, uh, typically get some very large hail with that. So that is what I was talking about in regards to how the dry line is going to move east and how um, areas that could be, you know, over here, you know, you don't see the dry line with this slide right here, but you could potentially see uh, the dry line move into those areas and see storms uh, initiate for your area. So something to keep that in mind. Low-level jet here, low-level shear uh, is almost southerly, uh, a bit more uh, southwesternly, uh, well, southwest, uh, south-southwest uh, flow here. Uh, but it is, it is prevalent for the most part. You can see shear values for the most part in... Uh, upwards of almost 40 knots in some areas and that's some pretty strong low level shear i mean it's moderately strong uh it's not like exceptionally strong but it's moderately strong for the most part and so uh you have your low level shear here in place i'll draw an arrow to indicate as to where the low level shear is moving off to so that we can see if there's any veering in the atmosphere and we'll take a look at the upper level winds the 500 millibar winds uh wind shear and you can see how the wind shear is uh, not there anymore because apparently I can't draw my arrow. Uh, you can see the wind shear here within this event um, is actually moving from the southwest. You have a lot of southwesterlies um, moving with this event. And so uh, with these arrows that are coming out from the south and the arrows that come out from the west, you can see a lot of veering in the atmosphere where the winds can shift uh, from due south to uh, almost west in some uh, almost west in some instances, and that can create uh, your potential for supercells and even tornadoes in some spots. But you have some wind shear here, uh, some values in upwards of fifty to sixty knots, uh, which isn't that bad um, for the most part. It's you know it's decent wind shear. Uh, it definitely beats the threshold for the uh, required amount that you need to have for severe storms. So uh, that's really all there is to say about that. <laughs> um, let's get into soundings here because I know that is your favorite thing for the most part. Uh, this is really technical for people who may not know what this is, uh, but this basically takes a look at the atmosphere uh, within a specific point. And so, you know, all the way down from the ground, all the way up to the top of the atmosphere, uh, you'll be able to see everything that occurs uh, within this general vicinity. So let's talk about it. This sounding is uh, one that I took near Austin. Uh, so southeast central Texas. Uh, your hodograph for the most part is actually not that bad. You can see how it veers off to the right. As I mentioned with how the winds uh, go up in height. They uh, tend to shift 
and you can see how the winds shift from due south to due west. Uh, you also have um, you also have a lot of the shear here from the three to six kilometers uh, moving out due west as well, and uh, that is uh, pretty good for cells if you don't want it to be a high precipitation uh, high precipitation based. I almost said high precip uh, participation based, and that would have been fun. That would have been a meme and a half. Um, but yeah, your outflow, um, your outflow, your venting within this supercell uh, will basically be out and away from the storm. And so I don't really anticipate a lot of high precipitation based uh, cells with this, even though the uh, precipitable water is uh, near the 1.7 area. So uh, I, I will say, you guys, if you are inside the, uh, the main core of the storm, the visibility will plummet significantly. So definitely something to monitor with that. This does seem to be uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit more of a, a long live uh, cell type sounding, but it is relatively weak. So we can't exactly call it long live if it doesn't sustain. If I move my face over to the side, um, which I'm probably going to keep that for the rest of this uh, sounding presentation. You can see CAPE numbers are in upwards of 2,000 joules per kilogram. Your lapse rates from surface to 3 kilometer lacks a bit to be desired, uh, but everything else in regards to lapse rates is actually pretty good. So, uh, you know, it's, your threat for severe weather is there. Um, you know, I would say there are a slight, slight chance for wind and hail and maybe even tornadoes within this area. I wouldn't rule it out, to be completely honest with you. Uh, so that's what this sounding tells me. This is a sounding here near the triple point in Wichita Falls um, in Oklahoma, well, Texas, uh, right along the Oklahoma border. Um, and you can see the hodograph has some really nice veering here. Um, a lot of streamwise vorticity here from zero to three kilometers, and then from three to four kilometers, uh, even in from uh, five to six kilometers. Uh, there isn't as much. It's actually the opposite. Um, called crosswise vorticity. So, um, on the southern, at the uh, southern parts, or not the southern parts, on the lower parts of the atmosphere, uh, you guys could potentially get some really nice mothership-looking cells that uh, could be forming off. But then anything over uh, three kilometers uh, could really get pretty messy. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some pancakes uh, in the sky from some of the storm chasers out. Uh, near that triple point. It's going to be a little bit dicey because it's going to be a little bit, you know, into the evening. But if there's a lot of lightning with this event, um, then you could potentially see the uh, the uh, mesocyclone, uh, really photogenic mesocyclone um, that could be occurring according to the sounding. Cape is uh, 3,000 joules per kilogram and above, so that's a lot of energy. We talked about that earlier. The lapse rates are really strong, so that tells me that there could be some significant hail, as well as this dry spike here at uh, 850 to 700 millibars. Uh, really dry in this area, so uh, that tells me that uh, we could... Well, that tells me, you know, multiple factors here tell me that it's going to have a lot of hail. Uh, but the only issue with this is that... Uh, sounding is a bit elevated or the, uh, the, uh, developing thunderstorm, the parcel line is a bit elevated as well as there is a bit of capping inversion. So I will say that much, but <coughs> excuse me. Um, oh, and one more thing, the, uh, hotograph, I was, I was thinking if I was, if I said it before, but the hotograph actually tells me that it is uh, most likely going to be high precipitation based, uh, due to the hotograph, um, uh, just by looking at it. So something to keep in mind with all of that as that continues to move on through. All right, this one is overnight Louisiana into Mississippi. This is the overnight threat that I was talking about. Uh, very strong veering hodograph for the most part, but then it veers back. We call that VB or veer back. Makes sense. Um, you know, outflow uh, for the most part steers itself off and away from the storm. So I wouldn't anticipate this to be uh, all too high precipitation based, although it's in the middle of the night, so I can't exactly, you know, say why you would want, uh, you know, I can't exactly justify why you'd want to chase in the middle of the night, but it also could help with um, sustaining structure uh, such as this one with 
uh, the potential for some uh, long-lived supercells if it, if it can develop. That's the key word, if. You know, it's, we can look at the holograph all we want and we can take a look at the right motion and say, oh, supercells all we want, but we got to make sure, you know, that they develop first. And so that's uh, definitely something that you have to continue to consider as time moves along. Capes forecast to be around 2,000, 2,500, so it's not that bad. A um, little bit of capping inversion here at uh, 850 millibars, so that's pretty interesting for the most part. Lapse rates are actually pretty good for Dixie Alley, so you guys could see some uh, large hail within some of those areas, but I don't anticipate a sporadic large hail event over there um, in Louisiana and Mississippi. Okay, day two, which is on Saturday. Uh, it's a slight risk currently that has been issued from the Storm Prediction Center, uh, which does include places like Atlanta, Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, Columbus, Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah, Tallahassee, um, Biloxi, as, as well as uh, Columbia, South Carolina. So if you guys live in this uh, in this yellow area down here, which I'm going to move my face over so that you guys can be able to actually see. Uh, if you guys live in these areas right here, you guys really need to monitor it. Um, as I said earlier, if you guys were paying attention um, for the day one outlook, I said that how the uh, models actually transfer over to Saturday still is in question. And we'll talk about that here in a second, but... As for right now, Storm Prediction Center has issued a slight risk for those areas. Hail risk actually shows that a significant hail that could form uh, with these storms with these strong lapse rates um, that we were talking about just a second ago with the uh, sounding that we took uh, for the overnight event. And so 15% um, chance is indicated in yellow, 5% chance is indicated in brown. Um, so whatever probability you have, that's your probability of getting uh, hail one inch size or larger and then you you have your sig risk which is located right here which could be two inch size hail or larger um so well 10 percent chance of of you seeing two inch size hail or larger within 25 miles of a point so something to keep in mind with that you also have a widespread wind risk here uh massive 15 percent um so whatever probability you have whether it's a five or a 15 58 mile per hour winds or greater uh, within 25 miles of a point is what you can expect with that one. And then you also have your tornado risk. And I mentioned this in yesterday's video that your tornado risk can mainly be on the southern edge of this. And uh, indeed, the Storm Prediction Center actually agrees. Not because it doesn't really want to, uh, but because that's where the most consistency is uh, as of right now with the models. That's where uh, most of the severe weather is forecasted to be. Um, consistently there is some areas that could potentially be worse and you know there is a model that's saying that uh, this event could be much worse than uh, what we're forecasting it to be right now but it's really hard to say especially since that model isn't really as consistent within this area um, but we still have to pay attention to it anyways just in case if it actually does happen you know we gotta we gotta think about all the different possibilities that uh, this may happen and uh, that's what I actually did here. I actually combined two models um, to actually uh, help support my thesis as to what I think is going to happen. Speaking of which, let us go into the timings for this event. So here's the morning hours. As I said, if you look up to the top, that's uh, the time into which uh, these storms could actually move on through. And so you have one QLCS, two QLCS, your other QLCS over here is dead, so I was going to say three, but uh, for the most part, multiple quasi-linear convective systems that are uh, present here in the morning. But this does seem to uh, kind of veer out a bit more according to this model known as the NAM, uh, the NAM or the North American model. This is the three kilometer version, so it's a lot more higher resolution um, to which it can uh, depict uh, better trends and a more precise uh, or more accurately what uh, it thinks it can happen rather than it just being low resolution and uh, vague. So a lot of thunderstorms are uh, going to be moving through Alabama and Georgia, uh, definitely in the morning hours into the uh, late morning hours. Uh, that'll continue to move off into the general vicinity 
of uh, South Carolina and towards the uh, early afternoon hours, especially along the coast of uh, the Carolinas. And then you have your new line that begins to develop uh, towards the uh, rear of the uh, of the uh, the low pressure system. The massive cold front with the uh, uh, strong wind shear aloft uh, is really driving this, according to the NAM three kilometer. And so uh, you can get these lines of storms that can begin to develop along the rear um, across places like Mississippi and Alabama, maybe even into Georgia, according to this model. But the H triple R actually does not agree with that. Uh, due to the fact that it thinks this line of convection right here, um, these lines of storms that move through Georgia and South Carolina, it actually says that it actually uh, creates a less of a chance of significant storms uh, within that general vicinity due to how it makes the air at the surface cooler. So um, you'll actually see that. It also makes it a lot less moist within those areas. Uh, so you'll see that towards the end of the uh, timing run here. But uh, for the most part, from the uh, early afternoon, that's when the lines really start to kick off. And uh, as this continues to progress, you can actually see here, this is the HRRR run uh, to where this is the uh, the line that I was talking about. But then you have a lot of these storms that are forming off on these different uh, QLCSs that is branching off. And so this is where you can get your severe risk of damaging winds, large hail if you're in Mississippi and Alabama, and maybe even a couple of tornadoes. So something to keep in mind with that. But this is the uh this is what the NAM says at that same time frame. Um although I th when I said I was, you know, combining the two models, I still think, you know, I I still think that the NAM is kind of correct, but the HRRR is also kind of correct. I think the storms that move through into Georgia and South Carolina will lessen the risk for you all. But I still think that you guys could see, you know, stuff like this with this, these lines of storms that'll move on through. I definitely think this is a possibility here. Uh, more likely, actually, than uh, what the HRRR says. But more storms begin to form off. And uh, now we're going to take a look at the HRRR for the latter stages of the event. So as I said, uh, latter stages being uh, evening into overnight hours, and you can see a lot of these cells that are really starting to form across places like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Uh, so this entire area, for the most part, could potentially see some um, severe risks. And then uh, by the later hours, I do not know why I do not have a time for this specific area. Uh, but this is actually, um, this is actually uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 o'clock Central. And uh, around the 9, 10 o'clock hours, that's when South Carolina can start uh, to get impacted again. Uh, so a lot of these storms that are really starting to push off. But by midnight, it should move out of the general vicinity of Georgia and South Carolina, or at least the severe risk. And the line really starts to push into Florida. But even then, it starts to die out. So that's something to keep in mind with that. So I mentioned before as to how the HRRR was saying that the event over in uh, South Carolina and Georgia in regards to tornadic potential was going to deplete. And this is what I meant by that. You can see how the moisture is not as strong as areas over here near Mississippi and Alabama. And so, um, you know, with how less or how much less moisture there is in these areas, it can really impact the storm as to how structurally it can function and how tornadic it is. So that's definitely something that we're going to want to continue to monitor. I most likely could be live streaming tomorrow's event as well. I'll have to uh, continue to monitor this as time progresses, but uh, still something that we're going to have to really watch out for as this uh, progresses on through. HRRR says that the CAPE numbers also uh, deplete significantly, almost to zero in some of these areas as well. But then you can see some CAPE numbers over in Mississippi and Alabama get to upwards 3,000 uh, 3, joules per kilogram, which uh, usually you want you know, 2,000 joules per kilogram and above. So with your convective available potential energy being that high, you definitely have the chance for some strong thunderstorms. Uh, strong supercells that could begin to develop within those areas. Here's the NAN 3 kilometers version of this event, and you can see the dew points get a lot higher in these areas over in Georgia and South Carolina. 
And that's what I'm concerned about is that if the low, if the uh, QLCS that moves on through and uh, through the morning or the band of storms that move on through in the morning uh, that the HRRR says will be there, if it's not, then we could potentially see a, uh, a bigger risk for severe storms in places like Georgia and South Carolina. But sorry for blinding you all. But uh, the, the uncertainty in regards to those areas is uh, very high right now. So I wouldn't be able to say if you guys are going to get uh, very strong, severe storms quite yet. I'd have to wait a little bit more. Um, maybe if I uh, look at the models again tonight, I'll probably have an answer. But it's still uh, really uncertain right now in regards to this event. But high dew points for the most part uh, here. Some and upwards get up into the 70s, and that is very, very moist. Anytime it gets into the 70s, that's when, uh, you know, you know there's a lot of energy within, within that area. And if we take a look at the convective available potential energy, it says exactly that here uh, from the NAM. So this is a lot of energy that's within these areas. There even is some energy that uh, is here in Georgia and stuff like that. Uh, so really want to watch this as it continues to progress. One thing that both models do agree upon for the most part is uh, the wind shear in the upper levels, but this is the lower level wind shear, and you're going to see uh, a huge difference here into what that um, that QLCS in the morning does to an event. So here's the NAM. Uh, this is what it thinks it's going to happen. Strong low level jet here for the most part uh, within this event. So I'll draw the arrows for the crossovers and stuff like that. Uh, so there is the low level jet. And then the upper level jet, which um, has some veering here, but it's more of a speed shear type veering. Uh, so uh, the potential for tornadic development is uh, present here within this model run. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. But I actually don't have the slide for the HRRR, but what it actually shows is there is literally... Uh, I'll go back here in a second. This area right here is not present here, according to the low level jet. And that's really, uh, really interesting uh, as to why the H uh, as to why the H triple R thinks that this event uh, really depletes. All right. Soundings again. Fun times. Uh, here's the H triple R and it actually shows you how linear this event is, according to um, according to it. You can see how straight your hodograph is for the most part. Um, and so this is definitely a uh, linear event according to the HRR. Um, you have decent amounts of cape. I'll switch over my face cam again. Decent amounts of cape, up to 3,000 joules per kilogram here. Uh, dew's pretty high. Lapse rates are not bad for Dixie Alley. And so here in South Central Alabama, the HRR really says it's more of a gusty wind and hail threat. But then if we move over to the NAM 3 kilometer for that same area at the exact same time, a huge difference, huge difference is evident here. Uh, you can clearly see there's very strong veering at the lower levels. The, uh, the outflow of the storm really just uh, projects outwards. So there's really not going to be any issues uh, with high precipitation type cells uh, unless, it be, unless if the uh, rear flank downdraft really surges heavily. But for the most part, uh, you could you could really start to see uh, some very long lived cells according to the NAM three kilometer, and that's the reason why I'm saying you know this event could be significant or it could be uh, you know something you know in the middle, like very uh, it could be strong, but it could also be weak. So that's that's how uncertain this event is for the most part. Uh, a lot of cape here for the most part. Uh, strong lapse rates according to the NAM. And so you can see basically all sorts of risks here according to this model run. And that's just something really interesting that I wanted to point out here. Going back to the HRRR, this is in Western Florida. And this is where both models somewhat kind of agree. Um, it's not exactly the best for the uh, HRRR. It's a lot more exaggerated on the uh, NAM. But you can still see that there's a little bit of veering from uh, the one to two kilometer region, especially with a lot of this speed shear at the uh, lower levels. A strong low level jet from zero to one kilometer. And then once it gets to the two kilometer 
uh, and even two to three kilometer, it's not really all too strong. But then your three to four kilometer, uh, even into the six kilometer vicinity, you have a lot of veering here as well. So uh, might see some elevated mesocyclones for the most part, but I wouldn't anticipate it to really translate it to the ground uh, if it was uh, according to the HRRR. But you do have a bit of that veering, so the tornadic potential is there. Uh, very, very contaminated sounding, as you guys can see. So uh, maybe the cap, the cape numbers are a bit over slash under exaggerated. Maybe the lapse rates are a bit over slash under exaggerated. But still, a uh, decent setup for the most part within this event here. This is in eastern Alabama and western Georgia, according to the NAM 3 kilometer. And this is what I was talking about in regards to how intense this event could potentially be. Because you can see, as I said, strong veering with this photograph. Um, cape numbers are still very strong. Lapse rates are still very strong. Um, yeah, so this is definitely something that we are really going to have to watch for the most part. And the uh, shear, as you head further north, is stronger and there is just as much energy uh, as you go further north. So this is uh, really something we're going to have to watch out for as we get closer to Saturday. Okay, let's move on here to something that's not as active. Sunday. There's absolutely nothing going on. Um, I'll move my face cam over because I'm actually blocking Florida. The chance for severe storms is here. I'd actually anticipate a marginal being around here in uh, Jacksonville, um, south of that as well. I would not be surprised if that was the case. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a marginal in Florida in general, but it just really depends upon how the event on Saturday stages out uh, in the long run. But for the most part, nothing happens on Saturday. Nothing really happens on, well, sorry, not Saturday. Nothing really happens on Sunday. Nothing really happens on Monday as well. So that's something interesting. This is where things get really interesting though. Tuesday, uh, there's a 15% chance for severe storms issued by the Storm Prediction Center. This has been very consistent on the model runs in regards to placement. So severe storms uh, are severe storms as possible here within this general vicinity. I am really concerned about this, not because of Tuesday, but because of Wednesday and how the actual um, trough actually deepens. And uh, so this is actually a very... Uh, uh, very strong setup for a potential uh, strong severe weather outbreak, maybe tornado outbreak, but we are relatively far out and we are using long range models to predict this event. So once we get closer towards the medium range models, then we'll have a better idea as to when that all can uh, really fire off and we won't have access to that until Saturday night. So something that we'll really have to watch out for as this progresses and moves along, but uh, let's take a look at the Euro here. Notice how I don't have timings at the top of your screen uh, because as I said, uh, models are subject to change. It's very hard to forecast this uh, being this far out uh, in regards to the exact placement because it's the tale of two different models. One model has it further west, one model has it further east. But I'm going to use the, uh, the Euro because this is the one that's a bit further west so it covers a lot more area and uh, I'm able to just help, you know, people who are in these areas, whether they're further east or not, you know, they're going to get storms. So rather be safe than sorry in that regard. But you can see here uh, in the late evening hours, for the most part, the potential for storms to develop here in Texas, Oklahoma and Kansas is possible. And as this progresses towards the overnight hours, you can see a line begin to develop here that extends. Um, and that will then translate into... A, a bit more of a gusty wind, maybe even tornadic threat, maybe some hail, but there is a lot of energy with this. We'll talk about that here in a second, but massive line of storms uh, that actually extend all the way up into places like Michigan. Um, you know, there's actually some potential for some storms over there. Maybe not as strong as uh, down to your south, but still, you know, present within your area. And so as that continues to translate, uh, more and more storms begin to form. Uh, they begin to uh, get stronger and they will continue to push off all the way into the early morning hours. Dew points in this general vicinity, very moist. Uh, you can see some get upwards to the uh, mid to upper 60s, 70s towards the coast and stuff like that. 70s actually here near uh, Texarkana. So 
Uh, very moist here for the most part within this event. Uh, Cape within this, according to the Euro, actually gets pretty high. Uh, summon upwards of 4,000 joules per kilogram. I'm not sure if that's uh, over-exaggerated or not. Personally, I think it might be. I think it might be a little bit less. But then again, as I said, we're in a very... Uh, we're in a we're very far away to say how much energy there is within this uh, environment, but still, uh, very strong setup here for the most part. Speaking of strong setups, here is our low level jet. You can see our uh, low level jets coming from the south for the most part until it gets to like Oklahoma and Kansas, to which it veers uh, from the south and west. Uh, and then we also have our uh, five hundred millibar. Um, uh, 500 millibar, uh, jet stream as well. Our wind shear up that high. You can see, uh, there's some very strong veering here for the most part, uh, within this event. Um, it's not actually not super strong veering. I, I take it back a little bit. Um, it's decent veering, decent to moderate veering for the most part. So the tornadic threat is possible here for, um, for Tuesday. Uh, within areas like Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, even into Missouri and Iowa, heading further up into Wisconsin and Illinois. Uh, the potential for you guys is there, but it's stronger down further south. Now I want to talk about Wednesday. And Wednesday is a bit more concerning, in my honest opinion. Uh, you still have your low pressure that's moving on through. This is towards the afternoon hours. Um, and you can see how... You still have your band of storms that are here in Texas. You also have some other storms that are up here in Kansas and uh, Missouri moving on through. And more of these storms begin to congeal and uh, central to eastern parts of Oklahoma into uh, central to northern parts of Texas, even into parts of Missouri. They even get some thunderstorms uh, that push on through. And so that's really interesting to say the least for that. Dew points are the exact same the next day. That's the reason why I'm a bit concerned, because there is a lot of moisture within this event. I mean, you can take a look and see here that most of these areas around the Tulsa area, even down to the Red River, uh, further down than that, you can see that these dew points are actually in upwards of the high 60s, almost to 70s in some areas. And so that is some really uh, strong moisture within this. And, uh, you know, something we're going to really want to watch out for, for the most part. There isn't as much cape occur according to the Euro with this event. Uh, as I said, we're pretty far out, so we can't exactly say a whole lot in regards to kinematics, but still something we're going to have to watch out for as this continues to progress. But one thing that we can confirm about, because both of the models agree with this, is the wind shear is absolutely mental. I mean, this is the low-level jet, and this is a lot stronger than the day prior. You have low-level jets and upwards of almost 50 knots in some spots and that's starting to get into the moderate to even uh very strong uh low level jet wind shear here so definitely something to really consider uh for the most part with this i'll draw my arrows to indicate the low level jet again so we can see the veering here um and so the next slide will come in and boom you have some more strong veering here um in some of these areas um decent crossovers for the most part um you know just by me looking at this veering i would not be surprised if uh there was some larger supercells uh larger inflow notches but that's just by me looking at this you know this can easily change uh as this moves on through but 100 percent some stronger wind shear we're starting to get into the moderate wind shear uh for uh 500 millibars or for the 500 millibar jet and so really, uh, really intense to say the least. I mean, when you get wind shear that's an upwards of 60 to 75 ish knots, that's, you know, that's pretty strong for the most part. So really something that we're going to have to watch out for. And maybe as this continues to progress to like Thursday, uh, even a severe weather event could occur here for like places of the Ohio and Mississippi river Valley. Um, even into the Ozarks, uh, down into maybe the deep south. We'll have to continue to watch that more as this progresses, but uh, very strong setup here for a potential multi-day severe weather outbreak to occur from Tuesday and onwards. So 
Uh, that's going to be it for me, guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys did like the video, please be sure to leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Turn on notifications. Share this with friends and family and on social media. Also, follow me on social media. As I said, I am going to be live streaming uh, Friday evening. I'm probably going to be live streaming on Saturday uh, as well. And uh, as we get closer and closer to this event here from Tuesday and onwards, I most likely will be live streaming that if everything is as it uh, as it says it is on the GFS and the Euro. So we'll, we'll have to continue to monitor this as it continues to move on through. Uh, but, yep, as I said, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Nate. I also go by Hockey Boy and Nate. I'll catch you in the next video. Peace.